Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class in our course on the Pentateuch. And today we are looking at a beautiful sunset in Idaho, where I just spent Holy Week. And it's appropriate that we come here to the desert of Idaho because we're going to now go to the desert of the Book of Numbers. This is the book that chronicles Israel's wandering in the wilderness, which is all desert in that part of the world, before they enter the Promised Land. Let's go ahead and look at our agenda for today. We'll begin with a brief reflection on what is the Book of Numbers as a whole, and then we're going to spend most of our time looking at a synchronic survey that is an outline of this book. What are the salient moments and details that we need to pull out of this fourth book of the Bible? And then we'll conclude with some reflections on the theology of the Book of Numbers. First, what is this book? What are we reading? And it's good to begin with a comparison of the Greek name for this book in the Septuagint, versus the Hebrew name. As you can see on your screen here, the Septuagint gives this book the name Arithmoi, from which we get the English word arithmetic, and this is where the English name numbers comes from, and it's based on the census figures in the book. In other words, that title comes just from one of the features of this 36-chapter book. The Masoretic text gives it a more descriptive name, coming from the first word of the book in Hebrew, Bamidbar which means in the wilderness or in the desert, and it's based on the setting of the book. As we said already, this book chronicles Israel's time of formation in the wilderness. And this is the time where Israel learns how to be God's holy people and indeed struggles quite a bit. Diachronically, and I'm just gonna say a word about the diachronic composition here, most of this book is from either J and E, so older material, but it's supplemented by P material. You can see that scholars make a distinction, that the pre-P, that is the J and E sections, talk about holy war and describe how rebellion leads to doom. Contrast that with the P sections that focus more on the beauty of the land and Israel's dependence on the Lord. It's also worth noting that while Leviticus traditionally is named after the Levites, Numbers actually talks about them more, and this brings us to our synchronic survey of the book. Let's begin with the opening chapter. The tribe of Levi alone you shall not enroll nor include in the census along with the other Israelites. These are instructions to Moses. You are to give the Levites charge of the tabernacle of the covenant with all its equipment and all that belongs to it. It is they who shall carry the tabernacle with all its equipment and who shall be its ministers, and they shall camp all around the tabernacle. Any unauthorized person who comes near it shall be put to death. So here you're noticing that same theology of holiness, of sacredness, of set apartedness that the Lord requires in his sanctuary. We already saw that in the book of Leviticus. We even saw it in the book of Exodus uh, at the Theophany at Sinai. Here we're seeing it again. It's worth noting that the mention of the Levites occurs more in the book of Numbers than any other book of the Bible, including Leviticus. You're noticing as you look at this chart, Leviticus only mentions the Levites four times. Now, in fairness, they're usually called the sons of Aaron or the priests, so a number of synonyms are used in the book of Leviticus, but Numbers uses this term far more often unless you combine First and Second Chronicles into one, and the Levites are a major theme there too. So let's take a step back here now for a moment and look at how the book of Numbers fits into the broader synchronic survey of the Pentateuch. You'll remember this slide which describes Sweeney's analysis of everything that happens from Exodus through Deuteronomy. Here we're now in the second trapezoid from the right. The book of Numbers largely describes journeys from Sinai to Moab. Israel has left Egypt, they've wandered a little bit, they've spent time at Sinai, now they're going to wander in the wilderness until they arrive at Moab, which faces the Promised Land. All of Deuteronomy will be set on the plains of Moab. As we look specifically at the book of Numbers, the first two chapters deal with the first census. They deal with the history of the tribes. Again, most of the rest of the book is going to focus on the Levites. We're going to hear about how the Levites are designated for priestly service. We're going to hear about what happens on the journey. Incidentally, a lot of bad things are going to happen. And then they will arrive at Moab, where more bad things will happen, as will a second census. So let's look a little bit at what happens in the book of Numbers. First, I want to call to your attention this famous passage, which the church reads on the solemnity of Mary, the mother of God, on January 1st. We are in Numbers chapter 6. Aaron and his sons are instructed to give this blessing to the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. Incidentally, the church reads this during the Christmas octave on January 1st because we believe that in Christ, 
who is full God and full man, the Lord indeed lets his face shine upon his people in a new way. So it completes the promise of this blessing. But continuing on with the Levites, we hear more in chapter 8 about the Levites' consecrated service. Notice what it says here. Only then shall the Levites enter upon their service in the tent of meeting, when you have cleansed them and presented them as an elevated offering. Here the Lord is speaking to Moses. For they, the Levites, among the Israelites, are totally dedicated to me. I have taken them for myself in place of everyone that opens the womb, the firstborn of all the Israelites. So what's happened after the golden calf incident back in Exodus 32, whereas the firstborn were specially sacred, and they still are, there's still an act of redemption to be done for the firstborn according to, to the Levitical law. Nevertheless, the Levites have this priestly role, this set apart role to sanctify the people of Israel. Alas, problems will start to emerge. As we move to chapter 11, we hear the beginning of a whole lot of complaining in the wilderness. In this slide, you can see from Numbers chapter 11, the riffraff among the people were so greedy for meat, they didn't like the manna, that even the Israelites lamented again, if only we had meat for food. Indeed, the Lord would send meat to the people in the form of quail, though he'd also send them a plague. All the complaining reaches ahead in Numbers chapters 13 and 14, when spies are sent into the promised land, but all but Joshua and Caleb come back saying, we can't possibly conquer these people. The Lord, therefore, does not allow them to conquer the people. Instead, they're gonna wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And the complaining continues, and not even Moses is exempt from unfaithfulness. There's an episode where the people are thirsty in the wilderness. And as we look at Numbers chapter 20, God commands Moses to speak to the rock, to give forth its water. Here's what happens. Raising his hand, Moses struck the rock twice with his staff, and water came out in abundance, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not have confidence in me to acknowledge my holiness before the Israelites, there's that word holiness again, therefore you shall not lead this assembly into the land I have given them. So Moses will also die outside the promised land. The second generation fares little better. In Numbers 25, the people decide they're going to have a reprise of the golden calf incident. Let's read it. While Israel was living at Shittim, the people profaned themselves by prostituting themselves with the Moabite women. These then invited the people to the sacrifices of their God, and the people ate of the sacrifices and bowed down to their God. When will these people learn that idolatry is bad? Perhaps once Phineas starts killing people because of it. Indeed, Phineas does precisely that, and he is praised by the Lord, as we read. Then the Lord said to Moses, Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned my anger from the Israelites by his being as jealous among them as I am. That is why I did not put an end to the Israelites in my jealousy. Even amid this wandering in the wilderness, God shows his grace to his people. He sends them Balaam, a prophet, who's sent by King Balak to curse the people. Balaam ends up not being able to do anything but pronounce blessings on God's people. God remains with his people during this time of testing. And this brings us to a reflection on the theology. And I like this quote from Terence Fretheim's Reflections on the Pentateuch. He says, Numbers centers on the problems and possibilities of shaping a community identity in tune with God's intentions for the creation. As a long oppressed community, Israel had a deeply ingrained identity as slave. The period of wandering is, at least in part, a necessary buffer between liberation and land for the sake of shaping such an identity. Such an identity does not come easy for Israel or for God. Even the most meticulous preparations for the journey are not able to make things go right. One can take the people out of Egypt, but it proves to be more difficult to take Egypt out of the people. It's easy to take the people away from sin but it's difficult to take the sin out of the people. We live this in the life of the church today. The entire scene concludes on the plains of Moab. When you go across the Jordan into the land of Canaan, dispossess all the inhabitants of the land before you, destroy all their stone figures, destroy all their molten images, and demolish all their high places, because they can be a temptation. And this sets the scene for the book of Deuteronomy, which will be our focus in our next class. Until then, Read well and pray well.